Honest communication between two people can produce personality transformation. And you, you know, you might think, well, you kind of know that already because there's something very engaging about a deep, honest conversation where you're able to say things that you wouldn't normally say, where you're being listened to by someone who's actually listening to you and you're listening to them. And in the conversation, you're moving both of you further to a different point. That's different than a conversation where you're right and you're trying to convince me or I'm right and I'm trying to convince you, which I would say is the typical conversation. The, the healing conversation is more, well, what's up with you? You know, how are you doing? What, how's your life going? Where, what sort of problems are you facing? What do you think about those problems? Can you conceptualize what a solution might be? Is there a way we could figure out how to get there? You know, it's, so it's a problem solving conversation and it's predicated on the presupposition that the person that you're conversing with has the capacity to grow in a positive direction if they so choose. There's lots of different places that you can act in the world and there's lots of different ways you can look at it and survive. That's why you can be a plumber and a lawyer and an engineer and th those all work, right? Even though they're very different modes of being and you can have different personalities and survive as long as you're capable of finding the place where your particular filters and behavioral proclivities match the demand of the environment. And a huge part, I would say, of successful adaptation is precisely that. I believe that you need to know what the world is made of, and I suppose that's the proper domain of science, but then you need to know how to act. And that's a whole different thing. And you need to know how to act. That's the thing you need to know most of anything, because of course you're a living creature and action in relationship to desired goals is, is everything to you. And you can think about that from a Darwinian perspective. You have to act at least so that you can survive, at least so that you can find a partner. That's, that's life. And so part of the question is, well, how does the world look if you think about it as a place to act? And the answer isn't a place of value-free objects. That's not what the world looks like. And you can't act in a world of value-free objects because there's no way of choosing between them. If everything has zero value, why would you choose one thing over another? You live in a world where things present themselves to you as of different value. You make yourself out of the information that you gather in the world. So you're an exploring creature. You explore specifically when the maps that you're using in the world are no longer orienting yourself properly when they're producing errors. You go out, gather information, and assemble yourself from the information that you discovered. There's some relationship between your personality and the manner in which your brain functions. I've often found it useful when I'm trying to remember something to have a story to hang the facts on. Otherwise, you're faced with the necessity of doing nothing but memorization. And it isn't obvious to me that memorization actually constitutes knowledge. What constitutes knowledge is the generation of a cognitive structure that enables you to conduct yourself more appropriately in life. And so I suppose you might say that you could argue that a course in psychology, especially in personality, is a course in applied wisdom as well. Assuming that wisdom is in part your capacity to understand yourselves so that you don't present too much of an intolerable mystery to yourself and also to understand others so that you can predict their behavior, understand their motivations, negotiate with them, listen to them, and formulate joint games with them so that you can integrate yourself reasonably well with another person and with a family and in society. You have to figure out ways of simplifying the world, right? Because you just can't do everything. And so people are specialized. They have specialized niches that they occupy. You could think about them as social niches. A niche is a place where your particular skills would serve to maintain you. And so if you're extroverted, you're going to look for a social niche because you like to be around people. And if you're introverted, you're going to spend much more time on your own. And so if you're an introverted person, for example, you're gonna want a job where you're not selling and where you're not surrounded by groups of people who are making social demands on you all the time because it'll wear you out.
Whereas if you're extroverted, that's just exactly what you want. And so the extrovert sees the world as a place of social opportunity. And the introvert sees the world as a place to retreat from and spend time alone. And it turns out that both of those modes of being are valid. The, the issue, at least to some degree, is whether or not you're fortunate enough to match your temperament with the demands of the environment. What exactly is personality? Or what exactly is a trait? Think of a trait as an element of personality. And I think the best way to think about a trait is as a sub-personality. So you're, you're made up of sub-personalities that are integrated into something vaguely resembling a unity, but the unity is, is diverse. Part of the reason it's useful to know what your traits are is because it can help you figure out how you should orient your life. Like, so for example, if you're high in extroversion, you know, you, you've, you've got a proclivity towards sales, for example. And you're gonna, like, you're gonna like occupations where you have a lot of opportunity for social interactions and social networking. You're not gonna be happy if your job requires you to sit alone by, you know, for, for extended periods of time and work in the absence of social interaction. So, and you want to be in a position that capitalizes on your traits because it's really difficult to work contrary to your traits. Imagine that you're looking for a stable partner, right? So you might think, well, what do you want in a stable partner? And at least in principle, one of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person. So for example, if you're really extroverted and you have a really introverted partner, you're gonna engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should, should subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so, if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say, whatever you want, whenever, and the a disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is gonna find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is gonna find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. Well, if you're conscientious, you're industrious and orderly. And orderly people seem to be sensitive to disgust. Industrious people find it um, unpleasant and unsettling to, to not be doing something. The industrious people can't stand sitting around doing nothing. In a, in a community where everyone knows everyone, the people who work hard are going to be pretty irritated on a fairly chronic basis with the pe people who are completely unproductive. And, my suspicions are that plenty of people who were completely unproductive in the history of, of, our, of the evolution of our species were wiped out by people who were unhappy with their lack of productivity. And so I think, generally speaking, human beings have this sense of ethical obligation with regards to one another to share labor. And people who are conscientious really, really feel that. So they feel bad if they're not busily working on something that's productive all the time. And so, the advantage to being with someone conscientious is, well, they're going to work like mad, but the disadvantage is they're, they're going to work like mad. So, you know, if you're looking for a partner that you want to relax with or have fun with or, or who isn't uptight, then a conscientious person is probably not a very good choice. On the other hand, if you're a conscientious person and you're living with someone who's really unconscientious, that's good because they might be able to help you relax, but you're not going to be happy with them because they don't work nearly as hard as you do. So if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're gonna regard you as like uptight and, and uh, over-concerned with details and, and, well, and unwilling to relax, that's for sure. And they're gonna regard you as, well, just a bloody mess. And how can anyone possibly live with someone like you? 
So another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run. And I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses. And there's a bit of a problem there, right? Because maybe an agreeable person can use a bit of a disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa, right? So we don't understand the optimal balance for, for, for long-term thriving in a relationship. But I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits, that where you're different is going to constitute a chronic source of conflict. If you're an extrovert, does being around groups of people make you energetic or does it exhaust you? And if, if you're the sort of person that, you know, will go to a party and interact with 20 people, then, then you have to go home and be by yourself for like two weeks, then you're introverted. Introverts are exhausted by social interactions. Extroverts are the opposite. They're energized by social interactions. And you know, you might be in the middle so that you can take it or leave it with regards to social interactions, but you're happy to go to them and you're happy to spend time by yourself. That's a pretty canonical question for, for extroversion versus introversion. It's a very stable trait, by the way. It's, it manifests itself early in life and it's, it's stable across the age span. Not completely. Introverts can learn to be extroverted. And extroverts can learn to spend time on their own. I think that actually your capacity to expand your ability past the initial constraints of your biological temperament is something like the development of character or wisdom. You know, so if you're an introvert by nature and you learn how to be extroverted, then that expands your domain of competence. And if you're extroverted and you learn to be introverted, the same thing. Well, since you're extroverted, you value being with people. And so you're going to look at the world for example, if you're extroverted, you come into a room like this, you think, oh, look, uh, it's a whole field of opportunity for social interactions. And if you're introverted, you think, well, maybe I'll go sit up in the corner and hope everybody leaves me the hell alone. But so, so it's an a priori set of perceptual structures that you bring to bear on a whole sequence of, in, of uh, environments. So for example, maybe you're high in openness versus low in openness. That's the creativity dimension. People who are high in openness tend to be artists and entrepreneurs. And open people will look at other people as uh, opportunities to engage in interesting intellectual conversations. And so you can tell when you're talking to someone's someone open, especially if they're very high in openness, because they're gonna wanna talk to you about ideas or about aesthetics. That's what, it's gonna go right away. So that's how they view you as a source of that sort of conversation. That's how they view the landscape. Someone who's high in neuroticism, which is a negative emotion dimension, is more likely to view the world as a place of threats to be to be protected against because they're they're more anxious and more prone to emotional pain so so that's the frame of reference issue so there's there's something about underlying fundamental psychological traits that determine or influence at least your value structures and they they do it at the level of perception they also tend to set your goals so extroverted people have as one goal the opportunity to engage with other people so extroverts love parties they live for parties. They love to tell jokes as well. It's a, that's a very good behavioral marker of extroversion. And so, because they value those sorts of things, they set them as goals in their life. Or you could say the extroversion operating within them sets them as goals within their life, depending on how deterministic you want to be about it. It's very necessary for people at some point in their life to dedicate themselves to a single game of some sort. You know, you have to become one thing at some point point in your life and the sacrifice of course is that you give up all the other things that you could become but you don't really have a choice because if you don't decide voluntarily to become one thing you know to become a, a disciplined adherent of some specific uh, practice or profession or viewpoint then you risk just aging chaotically and you, you don't get away with not aging so you might as well age into something that's that's actually something rather than just remaining or then just becoming an old child, which is really not a, not a good thing. It's not a good thing to see, especially by the time people hit about 40. It's not, it's not pretty for them or anyone else. And even at 30, it's getting pretty old at that point. 40, it's like it's almost irreparable at 40. And the reason for that is you, run, you start running out of opportunities. When you're young and stupid, people don't care because they think, well, you've, you know, whatever. You've got decades of possibility still ready to unfold in you but if you're in the same unspecified position at 40 
people are much less forgiving, especially because if they're going to hire someone who doesn't know what's going on or, or engage them in some sort of productive activity, they might as well take a chance on someone young and full of potential rather than someone who's really lived more than half of their life already, because of course you have by the time you're 40.